I'm Ewa Messer. I'm the producer and host of Poured Over. And yes, you know Bobby Finger's name from his podcast, Who Weekly. But also, you guys, this novel, this novel, his debut, The Old Place, is so charming. And it has a big beating heart, just like Where'd You Go, Bernadette, or one of Eleanor Brown's novels. And we're so excited that Bobby's here today to tell us all about The Old Place. Bobby, thank you so much for joining us. This is great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this is great so far. I mean, you've already said kind words. I'm (laughs) thrilled. This is amazing. Yeah. Okay, so where did this novel come from? This novel came from my childhood and my family and the town where I grew up until I was 13. It's a small town. I Geographically, like the way I describe this town, the way that I describe the streets, the railroad track, the, 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 the main street, the school, it's... It's from my memory of this town I grew up in, uh, Dehennis, Texas, which is so far removed from what the town is called in the novel, which is Billington. I kind of deliberately didn't want to name it anything remotely like Dehennis. I didn't want it mm-hmm. to be German. I was just like, I want it to be separate. I want it to be distance, even though it's that's what the town is. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's a town that my family is from, the finger side of my family. They're from there. Um, we have very deep roots in that town. Um and my family, my parents decided to move. And ever since we left, when I was 13, it's a place that I think about constantly. Mm-hmm. I think about it in hypothetical terms. It's something that I just sort of lose myself in all the time. I left before things really got complicated. You know, I left yeah. when I was 13. Mm-hmm. What if I had stayed until now? Mm-hmm. And what if I had left and gone back? You know, like it was the the book kind of, stemmed from this story that I had been working through in my mind, all of these hypothetical versions of myself. Mm -hmm. Um, And then it turned into this. So yeah, that's where the old place came from. Okay. What's the population? At the time it was under a thousand. It was maybe 900. Um, I think they've maybe, they've maybe, there may be a shoulder, head and shoulder Mm -hmm. above a thousand at this point, but it's not getting any bigger. You know, it's, it's, it's one of those small towns that is just, it's going to stay that way. And then mm-hmm. I think it's slowly just going, it's going to atrophy and then kind of no longer exist. It's, it's sad, but it still exists. And mm-hmm. there's like the final remnants of the families that I knew then are still there. Like the old people that I knew mm-hmm. there are either dead or they're getting quite old. So it just feels like, I don't know, my connections to that place are slowly dwindling. Oh, I haven't been back. My parents go back pretty frequently but kind uh-huh. of for those kind okay. of because they live in san antonio which is 90 minutes away and that's right. kind of a, a part of the book that's it's proximity to the big city because san antonio is a big city it is um and it's so close it's just it's just far enough away to yeah. feel impossible for a lot of people in this novel and i think for a lot of people there including myself i don't go back often i haven't been in five years my parents mm-hmm. i think th- there's a reason for my parents to go a couple times a year because they keep in touch and also they're just closer and a, mm-hmm. a lot of it has to do with you know funerals weddings those those sorts of things like a new a new birth i come from new england and i think there's a part of that place that i mean i haven't lived there in a million years mm-hmm. and i think there's a part of that place that i just carry around because there are behaviors and you know idioms and there's just stuff you carry around even if you're not yeah. going back regularly and Mm -hmm. mary alice okay there are four there are four women we're going to talk about first and these four women there's mary alice her sister catherine Mm -hmm. mary alice's neighbor ellie Mm -hmm. and then there's a newcomer to town called josie and josie Josie. is a transplant from brooklyn (laughs) yes she is (laughs) yes she is Uh, i love i love all of them i love josie they're fabulous these women but i will say too that Anyone, I think lots of us have Mary Alice's in our histories or our present, regardless of where you are. You could be in Illinois and you have a Mary Alice oh, because course. she's this she's this woman who's been teaching math for a very long time. Mm-hmm. She's a widow now and she has a son. Yeah. And we're going to learn a little bit about Michael, but we're also going to stay away from spoilers in this conversation because it's way more fun to do that. And it's way more fun to discover these folks. But Mary Alice, size 11 shoe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she's not little. Yep. No, oh, she's she is not. not little. No, she's not little. She is the heart in a lot of ways of this book. And even though she's prickly and even though she's a little intimidating, mm-hmm. she's still very, yeah, <laughs> yeah. She's, she's got some moments. But 
Mary Alice, when did she show up for you? How did she come? Like, who is this woman? She's so great. I have to pretend like I'm having a conversation with my mother really quickly. I'm like, mm-hmm. she's not you. She's not yeah. you. This isn't this isn't how I perceive you. And yep. um, that was that was a worry because I I think the very fact that I said it in in this town where I'm from, I, I mm-hmm. made my parents nervous, which mm-hmm. they told me. And it, but it made me nervous because I didn't. I didn't want anyone in that town. I didn't want anyone in the family to think that I was basing it on them because because I was not. Right. But Mary Alice came from. I mean, I've I've been thinking about the story for for so long. I, I wrote about it. I wrote it as a screenplay first years and years ago. Um, just and then it sort of, it morphed into this. You know, put it in a drawer for because that that's what I wrote. That's what I went to college to do. I never went mm-hmm. to like a a literary workshop and and thought I would pursue novel writing. I wanted to be a screenwriter. That mm-hmm. didn't work. I was like, well, I'll be a copywriter. I can get a job doing that. I don't want to have to move to Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. But when I was thinking about this story, I, I, I wanted to tell a story about my town because like you said, it's this thing that I carry with me all the time. It's a, it's a place I was for a long time ashamed of. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't like mm-hmm. telling people I was from a small town for so long. And over time, I came to accept it. I came to see it as this part of myself that was just the truth and the and a fact of my life and a fact of my history that is worth sharing. And so slowly over, you know, 20 plus years uh, away from that place, I came to a a moment in my life where I was even more comfortable really considering it and sharing it. And something that, as I said, like, I'm constantly thinking about it. And a hypothetical that was running through my head is, I think there's a lot of gay literature and gay art, gay movies, where the queer character leaves Mm-hmm. and escapes mm-hmm. and you see the entire story from the perspective of the person who left and you know their fabulous life or their not so fabulous life in this new place and their past is a memory for usually really understandable reasons like it's like trauma that they're leaving or it's you know it, it's this feeling of isolation that they want to leave and they want to break free and I love that I love those stories but I found myself wondering like what about the people you leave behind you know like what if what if you're leaving behind something that isn't so objectively terrible that's not mm-hmm. worth exploring? People who, what if the people in your life weren't villains? They were just kind of bad. You know, mm-hmm. they made some they made some bad choices. They made some mistakes in their parenting or their their way of being your friend. And I just thought that that perspective really spoke to me. Um, and they were the they were the people that I found myself thinking about most. You know, like what what did I leave behind? I left so young that. I, it's all it's all memories you know like I don't think I have a firm grasp on who these people were because I was so young but they're still they're Mm. incredibly like robust in my head as I mentioned at the top of the show there's so much heart in this novel and you know there's some messiness too because life is messy yeah but Mary Alice and her sister who shows up in the middle of the night and Catherine sort of kicks kicks the can over Mary Alice is no longer working as a teacher yes She's sticking her nose into things and making people feel slightly unwelcome. Poor Josie. We'll come back mm-hmm. to Josie in a second. Mm-hmm. But Catherine and Mary Alice have grown up in this town. When did Catherine show up? When did you know you were writing about sisters? I mean, it seems like they probably showed up at the same time, honestly. They showed up they showed up at the same time. And I mm-hmm. and again, I'm I'm trying to I, I want to avoid spoilers too. Yep. But they showed up at the same time because I wanted that parallel of the sister who left. Right. Yeah. I wanted someone who left and someone who stayed. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I wanted every possible option for, mm-hmm. for living in that town. And there are so, I mean, there, there are myriad options, right? Like there are more options than I could even put in this book, but those were, those were the more, the more pronounced ones. And they came at the same time. Um, I had a hard time. I had a hard time naming. I will say I had a hard time naming Catherine. I okay. didn't know what to call her for a very long time. Okay. Mary Alice was so obvious. Mm-hmm. Mary Alice was obvious. Ellie was obvious. Michael was obvious. Like all of these names just made so much sense. But Catherine, because I think Catherine's a little, Catherine is kind of tricky mm-hmm. because you don't, it takes a while to understand what her relationship with Mary Alice was and to learn the fact that they at one point had a wonderful relationship. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's you're kind of wondering for a long time, well, what ruined it? Well, right. why did she leave without contacting her? And so um, I knew I needed her to make Mary Alice make sense also. Right. Um, so they came at the same time. I had a moment where I thought Catherine was actually the bigger sister, the older sister. 
Mm-hmm. And then I realized, oh no, wait a minute. This is the baby sister taking the <laughs> reins the because sister. the older yeah. sister has uh-huh. made a mistake. Uh huh. Catherine leaves and comes back. Ellie, even though now she's been in this town for more than a decade, mm-hmm. she's still a newcomer. This is the kind of community yeah. you're, you're writing about where it's like you could live here for a couple of decades and you're still not from here. Yeah. You're still not from here. And she she still doesn't have many friends in town. Mm-hmm. A lot of that is a factor of her job, but she works mm-hmm. out of town. And I, and I love that dynamic. I always thought that was so mm-hmm. interesting that both of my parents worked in town. They were both teachers right. growing up mm-hmm. and they were, they were people who drove a long way. And that's just a very, and, and the, I love how much driving is in this book. Cause I just mm-hmm. don't do that here, but there's so much driving in Texas. And that's just, th- those are just like sort of these like little nebulous memories I have of growing up, just being in the truck a lot going Mm -hmm. some not having any idea where you're going but just knowing that oh we're going to this person's house we're going to run this particular errand and this is a woman who gets up she drives to another town to go to work that's where all of her coworkers are and she comes home and that's how it's been for 10 years she still Mm -hmm. feels disconnected um, but but she's happy you know in her way and every morning she starts her day by walking (laughs) over to the neighbors yeah and having coffee with mary alice and, you know, it's clear that they've been friends for a really long time, but also they do have some moments where you're like, huh, do you actually like each other? <laughs> yeah. It's true. But I think I thought that was so much fun to write it because I right. think that that I think that's so true of of the best friends you mm-hmm. have. I think it's so it's something that comes up a lot with friendship where it's like, oh, we can go so long without seeing each other. And then you come back and everything's everything's fine. But that's this is a version of that where you kind of have the same dynamic, but they live right next to each other, you know, mm-hmm. like they still feel quite distant, but they've started to see each other more often ever since she retired. So I, I, I liked writing this friendship because this was this, it was this deliberate act of Mary Alice where she said, mm-hmm. I need, I need to start this back up again. Mm-hmm. You know, like I, I, I want to put in the work to make this friendship happen. And I, as I've gotten older, like I realized that like maintaining friendships require work they require Mm -hmm. effort and it's effort that mary alice didn't want to put in for a very long time she had her reasons obviously but um i I just love the idea of like different ways friendships can be maintained over time it's very easy for her to sort of say i'm in my own little bubble i am doing my own little world oh the church picnic oh mary alice and the church picnic i will tell you Mm -hmm. you terrified me a little bit with the instructions for the potato salad because i was like if that were me (laughs) i would go to the grocery and I would buy potato. I, and I can actually oh. cook, but those instructions are just so terrifying mm-hmm. and so precise. And they're so very Mary Alice. Where it's like, mm-hmm. we know this works. Just do it this way. <laughs> and they're so simple. Like it's not, yeah. it's not a potato salad recipe. Mm-hmm. If someone, if someone asked me for a potato salad recommend recommendation, like I wouldn't give that classic, simple Southern potato right. salad as much as I love it. Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. but it's like, there's something about like, it's like an insidious simplicity, you know, like, it's just like, no, we're doing it this way. It's mayonnaise, it's onion, it's potato. It's egg. like, that's, that's it. And you're going to, and it's like, you're making these rules just as a, as a way of maintaining power, like grasping onto whatever power that you can somehow maintain. I mean, I'm, I'm speaking in Mary Alice's voice, but mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, I, I love the, I I love how simple it is and how complex it is at the same time. You know, it's this demanding thing. Which brings me to Josie. <laughs> because Mary Alice is no longer teaching the math class that Josie is now teaching. Right. And I have to tell you, if I were Josie and suddenly this woman with her size 11 foot came swanning <laughs> into my classroom and it's the first day uh-huh. of school yes. and these kids don't know you and anyone mm-hmm. who has been around teenagers long enough knows that you can't let them see your belly. <laughs> right. That's a right. terrible right. way to describe it. But, you know, teenagers know what's up. They're really smart. Yeah. And I don't think they always get enough credit for being really smart, but they know when something's not right. And I'm sorry, if the old teacher came swanning into the room and said, and I just want to see how you're doing this, I my eyes would get really big. And I think Josie and Mary Alice both are both aware of that. You know, mm-hmm. like Josie knows that she is setting the tone for the entire year. Mm-hmm. Mary Alice knows that what Josie did is going to set the tone for the entire year. And they can't articulate that in front of each other. Like they, they almost don't know if the other knows that they know, you know, like mm-hmm. it's, but they're, they're both smart women. They've both done this before. They know, they know how the teenagers are thinking and they're just, well, Josie is horrified. She's like, I, this is done. This is ruined. 
But at the same time, Josie's really excited to be in this tiny, tiny town in mm-hmm. Texas that her husband is from. Mm-hmm. I think she might be more excited to be there than he is. And he's not unhappy so. to be back, but she's really no. excited to be there. Like he's he's back down to, you know, a normal resting heartbeat. You know, mm-hmm. he's just back in his comfort level. And she's like, this is, it's like, it's almost like vacation, but she has to mm-hmm. keep, she almost has to keep convincing herself that it's not vacation. She's like, no, this is, this is where we live now. And I'm, and I'm doing it to like stick it to all of those people in New York that I'm sick of. You mm-hmm. know, I, I love the idea of after I moved to New York, it was, it was hard to imagine people were from here, you know, like, <laughs> but, you know what I mean? Like yeah. it, it was so, and I, and I love meeting people who are from Manhattan. I love finding out like how they grew up, how they mm-hmm. walked to school. They took the subway, like everything about it is so fascinating to me. And it wasn't until like I met a lot of them that some of them started moving away. And to mm-hmm. me, I'm like, why would you ever leave this place? But it <laughs> happens. And I'm realizing, oh, it's the same impulse that people or a variation of the impulse that people mm-hmm. in other places have when they want to move to New York. It's to them, it's old hat. She thinks it's really exciting. And no one else that she's friends with can understand why that's exciting. And it's sort of like, how dare you not understand why that's exciting to me? You know, you've got this tiny town, you've got these women, some have husbands, some do not, some have larger families, some do not. But when did you sort of figure out that the screenplay needed to evolve into a novel? Let's talk about the mechanics for a second, because it's you're taking something that's what, 75 pages max, 60 pages, something like that? Uh, it was a, it was. I mean, it was, it was, a, it was about 120, but those okay. are, you know, those are sparse pages. It's dialogue mm-hmm. heavy. Right. And that was a, that was a problem I had in, in screenwriting classes. Um, and also just if I would, if I would write, I mean, I, I, when I moved to New York, I, I worked in advertising. And so I was, mm-hmm. I was working as a copywriter. I was writing ads for, for years until I got a job working at Jezebel as just like a, a staff writer, like doing mm-hmm. more journalistic writer and I, writing. And I loved it. But I really, I never, once I graduated from college, I kind of, and I got this job, I get very, I was very settled in that life. I was like, that's mm-hmm. what I'm going to do. Like I, if, if I really want to be a screenwriter, if I really wanted to, I'd move to LA and I would try. Right. I don't feel like doing that. And I can just do this on the side. I was perfectly happy just writing a lot of screenplays and putting them in drawers or not even printing them, you know, like leaving them as PDFs, putting them in a folder, losing that hard drive, you know, like it. I was very content in not doing anything with them. I just liked having that outlet. And that's kind of how the podcast started too. It was just nice to do something superficial and fun and more creative than my day job. I was happy compartmentalizing all of that. But to to get to the answer to your question, Mm -hmm. I I had written it and I was happy with it. And I did not think that I would ever do anything with it. And a friend of mine um, who's a writer asked it came up in conversation at one mm-hmm. point and she asked if she could read it and no one ever wanted mm-hmm. to read it. And I would never ask anyone to read it because mm-hmm. it's not for anyone else. And I said, sure. And I was very nervous because I didn't ever send things to people. This was maybe in 2016 mm-hmm. and she read it and I was, I was really nervous about what she would say. And cause I wasn't used to that kind of workshopping or criticism. And all she said was, uh, I read it. This should be a novel. That was it. That was the that was the 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 totality of all of her comments, and I was sort of irritated because I was like, "Well, I don't write novels. What am I supposed <laughs> to do with that?" And I like, "Well, I don't do that." I was so thankful that she read it. Amazing! Can you mm-hmm. believe it? That's a lot of time. But I was like, "Well, okay, I'm not going to do that. That's not what I do. I never, I never, you know, was formally trained in doing this." And then the the process of um, turning it into a novel happened during the pandemic when I just okay. I needed I needed something to do entirely alone and that was completely separate from everything else. You have written a novel about love and loss and consequence and mm-hmm. you know it's not necessarily an easy thing to do without sounding like you're wagging your finger and saying oh, now all of you people read your cultural vegetables. I mean I it's yeah. a terrible terrible mixed metaphor that I use, but like there are times where you can pick up a book and feel like someone's, you know, sort of shaking their finger at you saying, now pay attention. And these women Mm -hmm. just are who they are. They just kind of flow across the page. And sometimes you look at them and say, that would be great. I would totally sit down and hang out with you. And then there are other times where you're just like, oh no. Oh, (laughs) get me out of here. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no, thank you. Go away. And I just, I, 
the way the story moves and the way it flows is just, it's so organic and lovely and they just kind of do their thing. And we have these moments where we're like, oh, I just want to sit for a second. So are you a linear writer? Um, yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, I, and anytime I had the impulse to like peek at my outline and say, I really want to write this scene. I, I had to stop myself because I, and and this is my first novel. So that may change, but there was, I was anxious about what it might do Mm -hmm. to the rest of the story if I skipped ahead. And maybe I'm capable of doing that, but I, I felt like I would more effectively like let that story grow if Mm -hmm. I didn't skip ahead. And especially, I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that it existed in this other form first. I was, mm-hmm. I really wanted to start fresh. And if I skipped ahead, I, I would have been relying on those bones that were already there. And right. I, I didn't, I didn't want to do that. And I, and I think that's how I'll continue to do it because I, I found it pretty effective. So I mentioned your podcast at the top of this show. Mm-hmm. And I have to say, I've been listening, you know, I, I listen to other people's stuff as I'm prepping for interviews. Uh, this is not Thank the novel you. I, not the novel I would have expected uh-huh. from you. <laughs> yeah. Not yeah. the novel I would have expected. So, I it seems like a left brain, right brain kind of thing. I suppose. I mean, there's this piece of you that wants the pop culture, and here's the piece of you that's sitting down with this yeah. really sort of sweet story. So. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about the show for a second. This was writing for pleasure. Yeah. Initially, it it was a manuscript that eventually sold and turned into a novel. Incredible. I couldn't, not even my wildest dreams could I have imagined that would happen. Mm-hmm. But it was writing for pleasure and it, it wasn't going to be pleasurable if it was just the same stuff I was doing all day. And I love, I mean, I have the stupidest, most wonderful job in the world and I love every minute of it. But like, I like separating those things. I like like having time for me and if it's time for me I'd rather it not bleed into mm-hmm. the time I have for work and so to me I mean I I think that separating it made each thing stronger or not stronger it made it so neither one would get like diluted I guess um but the podcast is about you asked about the podcast the show is something I've been doing for a while with mm-hmm. um my friend Lindsay Weber and it's about d-list celebrities I guess is the way the best way to describe them um there are thems and there are who's we separated celebrity into a binary Mm -hmm. thems are the celebrities who you say oh them and the who's are the people you say oh who's that who's on the cover of this magazine who's on the front page of people um and it's just really silly and it's about tabloid press it's about the silly antics that celebrities get into we don't really love covering you know celebrity death or celebrity major celebrity scandals because there are all number one plenty of other podcasts and news sources that do that we like to keep it as silly as possible and as light as mm-hmm. possible are you prepared for book twitter <laughs> no <laughs> i <laughs> i used to tweet all the yeah. time and then early in the pandemic i was like there was instagram and twitter became this and i know that everyone was doing it for their own reasons but mm-hmm. Twitter and Instagram started making me feel absolutely wild. I was like, why is everyone acting like things are fine and normal? Mm -hmm. And I was like on Instagram and I'd see people with their family and that would make me sad because I had no way of safely traveling across the country and seeing my family for so long. And it just, it made me so sad to see the other ways people were coping with things and that their ways were successful in ways that mine couldn't be. And I was just getting really upset and um, I stepped away from social media and now I have to kind of get back into it a little mm-hmm. bit, like dip my toes into it to, you know, it's not that I'm not ready for book Twitter. I'm not ready mm-hmm. for Twitter again. Yeah, um, I get it. But it's, it's fine. I was, I could do it before I can get back into it. Like it's, it's going to be okay. It's like returning to not quite a small town, but like returning to a city that I thought I left. <laughs> you know. Well, and part of why I raise social media, obviously, is it's changed the way we live. And that predates the pandemic, honestly. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you look at the way, I mean, I remember when magazine covers were a much bigger deal than they are now and magazines were, you know, four inches thick at certain points in the year because the advertising was just so out of control. And now it's kind of like, well, you don't really need that ecosystem has just changed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Whether it's for the better or not, I that is not my place to say. But it's kind of fascinating to me that you can use social and go straight to the source. 
I like it in Who Weekly terms mm-hmm. because the celebrities are on it mm-hmm. and kind of speaking to no one and everyone at the same time. And it's sort of like, do you know how big your audience is? Like, why aren't you thinking about the way that you're using this? Um, so I, I like I like the the feed that we have curated on Who Weekly's Twitter account mm-hmm. because it is totally absurd, totally unserious. It's this world of celebrity that kind of has no overlap with my own reality and mm-hmm. it, and it's fun like where when it becomes a reflection of my own reality it's like no I can I can deal with this elsewhere or like I don't want to I don't want to see what this person that I used to work with you know 15 years ago is doing like I have no interest in that and it is it's silly I mean there were some names I recognized and some names where I was like oh I have no idea where I'm going but okay I'll follow you guys because it's fun yeah. to listen to you and sort of, um, I'm also delighted to know that, you know, neither of you passed the psychopath test, but that's great. <laughs> if you had asked mm-hmm. me about that in a week, I would have forgotten it. Like yeah. the, the, the topics we talk about, like go in mm-hmm. one year and out the other and like two months. But it is about connection and writing books is about connection and reading is an active connection. And social media does have its place as a connector, you know, hopefully yeah. used, used for good more than disinformation, oh, yeah. but. Um, let's let's stick with the happy pieces of this. I rely on social media to find books to read, you know, yeah. like thank God for, you know, the Maris Kreismans of the world who are telling me what to buy, you know, yeah. like without that, what what would I, I'd be walking aimlessly everywhere, you know? She's a good egg. I like her. I'm very <laughs> yeah. fond of her. Those aren't the only pieces that have formed sort of you as a writer or a reader. I mean, obviously movies are clearly part of your story as well. I mean, you don't study screenplay, uh, screenwriting without, you know, wanting to be part of that yeah. particular thing. So can we do a quickie sort of top five movies for you that made you sort oh, of yeah. who you are as an artist though? Not just movies you, because I have terrible taste in movies. I will own that. I have terrible taste in movies. I love watching stuff blow up um, and Die Hard is a Christmas movie. But seriously, yeah. five movies mm-hmm. that made yeah, you an artist. There are movies that I watched all the time growing up. This is a very like, we didn't have cable growing up, but my, my family did a, we did, we recorded a lot of things off television and had, you know, like the VHSs that were labeled very well by my dad. Um, but they're just movies that I watched over and over again as a kid. And they're, they're things like, I don't know, First Wives Club is one of them. Like you'll, you'll notice the pattern that a lot of them are about like funny women, like the First Wives Club. I love the Pelican Brief. The Pelican mm-hmm. Brief, I'm obsessed with. It's the John Grisham book. It's the John Grisham book mm-hmm. to movie that I love the most of all of them. Mm-hmm. Um, I love, um, the first wives club i love titanic i love how many movies titanic is in one you know like i love uh, other top fives in her shoes which is also based on a book um yep. the kinds of books that i like to read too you know like uh, also about sisters um my cousin Vinny was a big formative one for me okay um which is kind of about in a sense i can kind of see i'd never thought about it until now but like i can see sort of how that could have led to something like the old place because there is something about like the Brooklynites, the the Brooklyn couple making their way to Alabama and dealing with this small town in a way that's not condescending. Um, It's really funny, but ultimately it's their condescending attitude towards the small town Mm -hmm. in Alabama that gets them in trouble. And it isn't until they kind of start falling in love with this place and treating these people with respect and as humans and as equals that they kind of crack the case. Um, and I'd n- I've never thought about that until just now, but I'm like, oh yeah, there's like, there's some DNA in there that I clearly was drawn to. Mm-hmm. Um, is that, is that five? I think that is five. Well, I don't <laughs> Um it's close oh, love, enough. <laughs> yeah. And I love, and, and to talk about things blowing up, I love all of the Mission Impossible movies. See? Violent I mean... movies. Like, I love Jackie Brown, you know, like, where there's just like, that's tons of murder in that movie. But that's also based on a book. Those are some those are some formative, big movies for me. Yeah, now I get it. It's it's all Yeah, now I totally get it. But I want to talk about you as a reader, too. And some of the folks who've influenced you Mm -hmm. from that front. I mean, yeah, you just talked about a couple of things that had been made into films from books. But yeah, he was a reader. Who's Bobby Finger? Books that I was reading so much. Mm-hmm. around the time that I started writing it I had just finished the newest Ann Tyler novel before I started writing this and I discovered her late in life like I mm-hmm. discovered her maybe the year before I um wrote that a year and a half and I just watched I read all of them just like kind of in a couple of months I just read all of them I 
I'm so drawn. I'd always been drawn to that kind of like domestic fiction tone. Um, like I've read Anne Patchett before, you know, like I, I like I, I like those sorts of domestic dramas like um, Kent Harreff novels. I loved those books that were in like a small town. Brideshead Revisit is a, is a big one. Um, OK, OK, wait a minute. Evelyn Waugh. And, <laughs> yes. OK, we need to talk because I do. I, I love him. I yes. love all of his stuff. And I've yeah. always loved his stuff, including Brideshead. So I'm yeah. having a moment where we're talking about Brideshead in the context of a tiny Texas town. <laughs> we And it has nothing to do with it in terms of mm -hmm. in terms of setting. When I moved to New York, I was leaving this place. I was leaving Texas and I was getting very emotional about it and very like um, in my feelings about it. And I was looking through my dad's one of my dad's bookshelves and i found this old copy of brides had revisited and i opened it up and i'd never opened it up before i'd never read it i never read that in in college ever mm -hmm. and i said oh i should read i should probably read this you know and i asked my dad if i could take it on the take it with me he said sure my, oh that was your grandmother's favorite book she'd love that you even picked it up and i thought that was so interesting mm -hmm. <laughs> that this old Texas lady that was her favorite book and I opened it up and it, it I've I've lost two things I've cried about losing two things in my life and one of them was this copy of this book that I lost in a, one of my New York moves but it was filled with scribblings and notes and she had it was like a maybe a 1960s or 70s copy of it mm -hmm. um and she had all of these uh clippings in there I guess it, they were about um Evelyn they were about the novel I think maybe on like the 20th anniversary or something again I lost it can't revisit these things but when i read it i was like my catholic grandma liked this gay novel like and i know it's not explicitly a gay novel but like there's a the subtext is there's this like kind of queer romance at the center of this thing um or at least close to the center of this thing and number that was a that was sort of this motivating novel that made me start reading a lot more again when i was in my early 20s and to think that my grandmother, this small town Texas woman, was Catholic woman just, and I think a lot of her admiration for Evelyn Waugh had to do with this Catholicism and his like kind of him coming to the church late in life. I know that that definitely must have had something to do with her connection mm -hmm. with him. But at the same time, if she really read a lot about him, she probably read about the fact that he was probably, you know, queer in real life, even though that's something that he didn't speak about. It was written about him. And I was just like, this, we could have talked about this. Like, what yeah. what would my grandmother have said if, you know, I came to her at 25 and said, you know, I'm gay. I came to her later and said, I'm marrying a man. Like, until I had read that book and known that it was so special to her, I had a completely different perspective of her. It opened her up to me. And I think that had I not read that book when I read it, Mary Alice wouldn't exist at all. I get that. Yeah. We find the right books when we're supposed to find them. Yeah. But, you know, the one thing I keep hearing through all of your work, whether it's the novel or having, you know, loved movies or what have you, it's story. Mm -hmm. It's always about story. And, you know, even as a copywriter, honestly, I mean, <laughs> I've written scads and scads and scads of book copy. You're looking for the story. And it's not necessarily just summarizing the thing in the book. It's like, what's the story about the book that's going to make someone say, oh, yeah, this is the one I'm buying right now. Mm -hmm. I, there are times where it's really easy, and then there are times where you're just like, um, okay, here we go. Yeah. See what yeah. we can do. It's all story. It's all story. It's the best bits. It's like the thing you wait to tell a friend at the end of the day where yeah. you're like, you're not going to believe. <laughs> and then you go from there. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And I, I think that that's also something that the realization that it's all story is something that I came to late. Like, I, I couldn't have written this book at any other point in time than when I mm -hmm. wrote it. Yeah. And I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that I was intimidated by the fact that I hadn't, like all of these writers that I love and admire are brilliant and so eloquent and better with, I mean, I, I love, I love all kinds of books. I love books that you wouldn't necessarily consider like eloquently written. But like when mm -hmm. I think of like, when I think of authorship, it felt kind of unattainable to me. I was like, well, that's not, that's not what I do. I don't do that sort of like prose writing. I don't have that sort of training. I don't have that sort of passion for it. It's not something that I want to do ever since I was five years old, you know, and realizing that like, okay, what, I, what do I want to do here? Fundamentally, I want to tell this story mm -hmm. and I'm going to, I'm going to try to tell it. 
And I think realizing that kind of opened, opened things up for me that I never thought could be opened. And maybe I didn't even want them to just because I, like I said, I, I was very comfortable with the fact that like, I was what I was and I did what I did and that was fine. And it's, I, I've slowly been going through this journey, you know, professionally where it's like, no, I don't, I don't have to close those doors. It doesn't have to be this binary of like, I do this or that. That's it. And that's like a, that was like a slow and, and tough lesson to learn. Cast, I'm mm -hmm. more podcast. I would love to do the podcast until I'm dead in the ground. You know, mm -hmm. I, I love it. I think it's, it's just, I feel so lucky to do that. I'll do it for as long as the two of us are willing to do it. And I think that we'll be willing to do it forever. Um, and I'm, I'm working on something else. I'm working on book number two and we'll see how it goes. So good. Yeah. I'm very mm -hmm. happy to hear that book number two is, you yeah. know, <laughs> somewhere in the process. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Some okay. words exist. <laughs> yeah. That's good. That's mm -hmm. good. We can, I've said this to other writers, but I'll say it to you too. We can be patient. We can actually oh, be patient. <laughs> you'll have to be patient. You'll have to be patient. Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. We'll get there when we get there. Bobby, I know we're bumping up on, I would rather just sit here and hang out with you and talk about this book until the cows come home, pardon the pun. But I want to ask you one thing before we go, because I know I've been dancing around a lot and I've made it really clear that we're dancing around a lot. But, you know, Ellie has a son and Mary Alice's son, Michael, the two boys become friends. And there was a sweet moment between the two of them early on where I'm guessing that was one of your favorite scenes to write. Can you talk about that for a second before I let you go? It's a scene early on when they meet. When Kenny moves to town with his mother, they move in next door. Mm -hmm. And I think it's even something that surprises Mary Alice that she's eager to meet her. Right. Because I think that's another thing about small towns. I think there might be an assumption that like, oh, it's everyone's close and everyone talks to each other. No, people are just as mean. People are just as like closed off as they are in, in big cities. I mean, obviously there are shades of that, but like you could live next door to someone and not engage with them frequently and so mary alice surprises i think both herself and michael by going to ellie's door and introducing mm -hmm. herself and kind of initiating a friendship and saying i'm going to start this and it just so happens that this boy is, is it's kenny and he's michael's age and they instantly like they forge a friendship that is that sort of unspoken adolescent recognition of difference i guess mm -hmm. or like a similarity and like presentation where it's mm -hmm. like Michael could sense that Kenny was uncomfortable. Kenny could sense that Michael was uncomfortable and are the two of them gay probably, but that's not really even in their vernacular at this point. It's mm -hmm. just like, I see a little bit of myself in you. I think we could be friends. And in their first moment as friends, they go to um, Mary Alice and Michael's house and they play Nintendo. And it's just this totally in any other space if it had just been two boys who were you know very popular at school playing nintendo there would be no subtext there it would be two boys playing nintendo but because of their difference there's this warm connection there and they don't really know what's happening and i loved i loved kind of writing that scene because i don't know that a lot of straight readers or a lot of readers would think about that you like mm -hmm. are, are really considering how tough it is when you have this identity that feels so dissimilar to everyone around everyone else around you and you're just trying to make a friend like i needed that scene um even though it wasn't necessarily advancing any kind of plot it was like a piece of it was a piece of character that like i would never cut out you know i think it all goes back to what you were saying at the top of the show though that you want to know what happens to the people in this community and you're not separating your characters from their community. And I think that's really important. And I think it was, it was a fun moment to read these nerd baby, these nerd baby boys. Just playing play Mario Nintendo. Kart. <laughs> yeah. Just playing Mario Kart. Uh -huh. But also knowing that, you know, yeah, the subtext, I know you're not drawing a direct line from Brideshead, but now that I know that Brideshead. <laughs> I would never draw a direct I, line. I I'm not never. saying you did. I'm not saying you did, but that's part of the fun of being in and around books is connecting the dots and it's connecting the dots about who we are, whether you're the creator or you're the person who's reading the story. I think connecting the dots is always just kind of a treat. And it's partially. Yeah, and knowing that some people would be connecting the dots and that other people wouldn't, you know, I think was very satisfying to me. Like I know that, that queer readers might be connecting those dots instantly. Whereas mm -hmm. like 
like my mom or someone may have not put the pieces together until page 250. You know, like they may not have figured it out. And and that's that's like the space that I live in, you know? So I, 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 found, I found that really satisfying to write. And it was really lovely to see that everyone gets their space and mm. everyone gets their truth and everyone gets a moment. Mm-hmm. And I think I'm going to leave it there because I really... We are so dancing around so many other things, but you know what? You've got Mary Alice, you've got Catherine, you've got Ellie, and you've got Josie, and the world just, it revolves around them. And it's kind of cool to see. It is cool to see, actually, yeah. Bobby Finger, thank you so much for joining us on Poured Over. The Old Place is out now. Thank you so much. Hello, readers. It's time for another TBR Top Off, where we recommend books to pick up when you stop in for your copy of the old place. I'm Mark. And I'm Becky. And we're coming to you from our home store in Cincinnati. Um, I've got a pretty good one. So if you don't mind, I'm going to dive right in. Thank you very much. (laughs) So I chose a book by one of my favorite authors, uh, Mr. Tom Parada. Um, He was a former guest on Poured Over. Mm. uh, So please uh, give yourself a, a favor and check out the episode where um, Miwa interviews him about his newest book, Tracy Flick Can't Win. Uh, Today, however, we're going to talk about one of his earlier books, Mrs. Fletcher. Uh, First of all, I really love this author. He is the nosy neighbor. He is the observant but potentially unhinged neighborhood (laughs) vagabond. Uh, He just knows suburbia and he tells it well. He places suburbia on, on a stage that is lit with humor and honesty and absurdity. And uh, this book is no exception. It follows a woman named Eve, uh, who is just facing the emptiest of nests. Uh, She's divorced, her son is going off to college, and she's pretty bored and doesn't really know what to do with herself. In her floundering, uh, she makes some new connections, many of them hilarious and, and, and absurd and fantastic. Um, and just begins to view middle age not as an end of an era, but more the beginning of something fresh and exciting and fascinating. Um, I think that anybody will attach themselves to Mrs. Fletcher. Uh, she's just somebody who, like all of us, sometimes just needs that little kick to get some drive back into us. Um, I just... She just makes me smile. I want to give her a hug. I want to kind of give her a shake. Um, but it's it's an incredible book. So please, please check out Mrs. Fletcher. Becky, do you have one for us? I do. And it has another one of those characters that you, oh my goodness, yeah, will give you so many feels, so many different feels. Okay. Um, so the book that I thought of is A Man Called Uva oh. by Frederick Bachman. Yay. This is... I, I, I think it's a classic. I feel like you can call it a classic. I would at this say point, yes. Right? Yep. Oh, yeah. Um, but what made me think, it just made me think of um, the main character in The Old Place, that they're both these older people with this curmudgeonly kind of like this exterior that they're showing everyone, but there's a lot more inside. Uh, and, um, and in this case, yeah. Uva is, um, if you've seen Up, um, Pixar uh, animated movie Up, um, he's Carl. He's, uh-huh. um, he's just this curmudgeonly old man, um, kind of that stereotype of, you know, the cranky old man who's like, get those, get those kids off my lawn, you know, that kind of idea. He's very, just, he just feels like he's surrounded by idiots and he doesn't have the time for any of them. He's, <laughs> he's very sour on life and, um, and he has a right to be. Um, at 59, he is someone who has experienced great loss. Um, he has lost the love of his life. His wife, Sonia, has passed away. He's lost his job. And he just, he's just not in a good place. Um, life is not something that really interests him anymore. And he's thinking about maybe it's just better if he doesn't have to experience it anymore. Um, but as happens, Things just kind of spin a little out of control when a new family moves in next door. This young family who uh, the husband is just, I don't know, just catastrophe uh, (laughs) laden. I'm not sure. Um, Two little kids. The wife is, they're just, it's a wonderful family. 
and the energy that is infused into Uva's life just with their neighborliness um, and the connections that are made. And it just, that hard exterior, that shell cracks. And it's just so sweet. Um, this is just, it's such a fun book because it is one of those books where you are laughing at, at his thoughts and kind of observations on people. And the next page, you are in tears. And it's, uh, it just takes you on such a journey. I highly recommend it. It is A Man Called Uva. Oh, <laughs> fantastic. Yes. Such a good book. Oh. Um, well, that is all we have for today. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in to Port Over. Uh, please make sure to support us with a rating and subscribe so you never miss an episode. I'm Mark. I'm Becky. And you can follow our home store at BN Westchester. You can also follow Port Over at Barnes & Noble. Pretty simple. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Have a wonderful day. Happy reading. Bye. Bye. Port Over is a Barnes & Noble production. The show is available on Apple, Spotify, and Stitcher. Please rate and review us wherever you listen to podcasts.